Good morning, Pastor Riley. Good morning. How are you? I am well. How are you? I am okay. I am having some technical difficulties this morning. Okay. So um, everybody who's out there, say a prayer that uh, my computer and internet and everything else decides to um, behave itself. Riley, today <laughs> is the day that God has made. Indeed it is. So let us rejoice and be, uh, and be glad. Um, let's all take a deep breath. I need it. <sighs> Good to be together on this first Sunday of 2021. So let us now prepare ourselves for worship. Please join with me in our call to worship. We are gathered to worship our God. Send your spirit upon us. We come from many places with many burdens. Send your spirit upon us. We turn our hearts to you, O God. Send your spirit upon us and make us your beloved family. places. Come near to us and hear our confession. In this new year, rid us of all judgment and malice. Free us from all shame and guilt. Unburden us of selfishness and vanity. Give us the capacity to accept your grace. Give us the wisdom to extend grace to others. O oh, Holy One, forgive us once again. Hear now these words of assurance. Our God is a forgetful God who forgives our iniquities and remembers our sins no more. 
Lift up your heads, O beloved of God. God's grace is given to you. Amen. Friends, since we have been forgiven in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of God be with you. And also with you. Let us exchange the peace to those who are with us and to those in our chat box on Zoom. All right, friends, let's continue our service of worship with our um, choir anthem. What star is this with beams so bright, more lovely than the noonday night? Tis sent to announce a newborn king, glad tidings of our God to bring. Tis now fulfilled what God decreed, from Jacob shall a star proceed, and lo, the eastern sages stand to read in heaven the Lord's command. Jesus, while the star of grace compels us on to seek your face, let not our idle hearts refuse the guidance of your light to use. To God the Father, God the Son, and Holy Spirit, reading this morning is from Luke chapter 2 verses 41 to 52 the boy Jesus in the temple now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover and when he was 12 years old they went up as usual for the festival when the festival was ended and they started to return the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem but his parents did not know it Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Over the last few weeks, my family and I have watched a fair amount of Christmas movies. And this year we introduced our children to the 1990s classic Home Alone. And if you haven't seen it in Home Alone, you learn the story of the McAllister family. They are getting ready to head to Paris to visit relatives for Christmas. Aunts and uncles and many cousins are visiting. And in confusion that ensues after sleeping through the morning's alarm and the threat of missing their plane, no one remembers to wake up eight-year-old Kevin who being displaced by so many extra family members had been sleeping in the attic. Kevin finds himself home alone a few days before Christmas. And it's not until 
His mother is mid-flight, the grown-ups in first class and the children all in coach, that she realizes Kevin is the one thing she forgot to bring with her. Now, eight-year-old Kevin proves to be brilliant at preventing two robbers from breaking into the house, leaving booby traps in perfect places and creating obstacles and eventually leading the police right to them. Introducing this to my children this year was particularly delightful because my oldest loves slapstick comedy, and this movie is full of it. But while we all enjoyed the movie, seeing it 30 years after it debuted with now two children of my own, I couldn't help but wonder what mother would leave her child asleep in his bed as she headed off to France. I don't care how many children are part of the extended family and traveling with you. I don't care how late you are to your flight. You would still notice if you didn't have one of your own children with you, wouldn't you? Well, apparently not Mary and Joseph, parents of Jesus who make a similar mistake, according to the Gospel of Luke. They have been in Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover, and in all the hubbub of leaving and heading back home to Nazareth with all their friends and relatives traveling with them, Mary and Joseph didn't seem to notice that Jesus was not with them. Like little eight-year-old Kevin McAllister, Jesus has also been left behind. And while we modern parents might not understand how in God's name this could happen, I would imagine that a 12-year-old boy in the ancient world traveling with an extended community would need to take some responsibility for himself. It would not just fall on his parents' shoulders that he keep up with the group. After all, we have to assume that Mary and Joseph had several younger children at this point and were also most likely helping relatives and families with their own burdens. It's not all their fault. But in the end, we feel bad for both child and parent, for the child left behind and the parents anxiously searching, and we would not want to be either. Our story this morning is unique. It is the only story recorded in the Bible in which we see Jesus as a child. Luke has finished the infancy narrative and gives us this one glimpse into Jesus, Son of God, at age 12. It is a hinge point between Jesus the infant and Jesus the man. In contrast, some of our other Gospels don't even talk about Jesus as a baby, let alone as a child. For instance, the Gospel of Mark leaves out infancy and childhood completely and starts right after Jesus gets baptized as a man. Lots of people like to speculate about what Jesus was like as a child. And the Gospel of Thomas, which was never included in the Bible, has some interesting stories. There is so much that we do not know. But there is something Luke is trying to tell us this morning. Something much more than Mary and Joseph's parenting style. It points to, this story points to a feature of Jesus' ministry that will be one of the most disturbing for many, that he dismantles traditional notions of family. In his article, Family Values in the Gospel Tradition, Jörg Frey argues that early Christianity opened up the possibility of a religious affiliation different from that suggested, suggested by ethnic, tribal, or familial tradition. A first challenge to traditional family obligations can be seen in the lifestyle of Jesus and his earliest disciples. 
Frey goes on to point out the often oppositional relationship between Jesus and his family in the earliest gospel, the gospel of Mark. Frey writes, common family obligations are questioned and those who follow Jesus and God's word are called his real family as opposed to his family of blood. In Matthew and Luke, the distance is softened due to the idea that Jesus' family is already aware of his mission and identity. In the Gospel of John, his earthly mother is present under his cross, and also Joseph as his father is openly mentioned, but his true origins are in the realm of God. Family aspects are transferred to the community, which is the new family of God, shaped by the mutual love and support of the disciples. A new family. And this passage from Luke chapter 2 plays with names. Jesus becomes child and Mary and Joseph who after all have proper names we know who they are but Luke calls them simply his parents and I think this is intentional the specifics begin to fade and this becomes a story between a child and mother and father between mother and father and their child and at the end of it after all the searching and the anxiety and the worry Jesus reminds them that his true father his real father is God. Didn't you know I would be in my father's house? As if this, this relationship, the one between him and his God, not that one, not the one between him and his family, but this one between him and God is the most important relationship. Didn't you know I would be in my father's house? My father's house. And the thing about the names, Jesus and Mary and Joseph just becoming child and parent, means that this goes for us too. Our father. Our God. When I was little, my best friend lived down the street and we went to Catholic school together together. And one day she said to me with much concern, Sister Mary Margaret told me I am to love God more than I love anyone else. But do you think it's okay if I love my mother more? Being Protestant, I assured her it was. Now on the other side of this coin are people who reject any concept of God as parent. Some people cannot call God Father, cannot refer to God as Father because their own relationship with their, let's call it their earthly father, was so abusive. It goes the same way for some folks referring to God as Mother. How can I call God my father or my mother when all it does is remind me of the abuse I received at my father or my mother's hands, they say. And so God cannot be conceptualized as a parent because parents have been so hurtful. God needs to be wholly other to that person with that particular life experience outside the realm of harmful and hurtful familial relations. And I understand that. And yet for others, claiming God as father or mother, or divine parent can be liberating. And we experience parental love in a new and unconditional way. It becomes a, a vehicle for healing old wounds, this new family. In her book, Atlas Girl, Finding Home in the Last Place I Thought to Look, Emily Warenga writes about her difficult relationship with her own father, a work-obsessed pastor who always put his congregation first. Her childhood, she writes, was a battle with anorexia and feelings of deep unworthiness and shame. 
She writes to others struggling with similar realities. She writes, maybe your parent was absent in your life. Maybe your father said he loved you but did very unlovely things. Maybe he left when you were little and you've always blamed yourself. You've always wondered why you weren't enough to make him stick around. And even though you go to church, you can't call God Father because it makes you sick inside. Father means neglect to you. It means absent or it means painfully and awfully present. And yet, she writes, we all long for one. We all long for a parent we can run to. We are all prodigals trying to find a place to belong. And then she writes, you see, Jesus didn't come just to give us salvation. He came to bring us a family. The Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is a heavenly family for all of us who feel homeless here on earth. God sent Jesus to take our hands and lead us gently along the path, and even as we walk, to learn about a father who sees the sparrow fall, who collects our tears in a bottle, who wove us together in our mother's wombs, who sings over us. And when we finally reach the throne room, there he is, running toward us, arms outstretched, and he gathers us close. And we can feel the heartbeat of the universe pounding through his chest. And we know we've come home. The metaphor of God as parent, not because our own parents are perfect, but because they are imperfect, and yet we all need and desire and yearn for that perfect love that unconditional love. Those of us who are parents want so much to be able to be the perfect parent, to give the perfect love, but we cannot because the perfect love only comes from God. And so we hope we are good enough parents. In his article, Learning from Our Children, Peter Woods writes about learning to be the good enough parent. He thinks that's part of what Mary and Joseph learn when they leave Jesus behind in Jerusalem. He says, Mary and Joseph begin their school of good enough parenting by learning the following lessons. Children are never really lost. And children find their true home despite us. As Jesus does, as Jesus finds his true home in the temple, in his father's house. Woods quotes the poet Khalil Gibran, who writes, Your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They came through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. Who do we belong to? Jesus knows who he belongs to, the strongest affiliation of his life, not necessarily his tribe or his family, but his God. Do we know who we belong to? This might be one of the strongest messages of the gospel, that we belong to a God who we can trust a God who claims us as one of her own, a love beyond all love, a God who will never leave us behind or let us alone. Humans all mess up, we all fail, all families have brokenness and deep pain in them. Nothing and no one is perfect. But thanks be to God that we, are also, we also belong to a larger family and to a larger holy realm of which we see flashes of in moments of love and generosity here on earth. Whether you call God father or mother, ground of being, source of life, holy mystery, Lord, spirit, creator, or or love itself, we all belong. 
we all belong. Didn't you know I would be in my father's house? The child says to his parents, and they realize what he has already come to know, that he is not theirs, but God's, and that he has found his true home. May it be so for us. Amen. Friends, we come now to our time of sharing our joys and concerns. And I wanted to let you know that I got word from Steve Lefevre this morning that his dad, Ben, is in the hospital, has COVID-19 and pneumonia. Um, so we want to send a copious amount of prayers in that direction. Um, we also got a um, prayer request from Jane Horan, who is in um, Wesley. And um, she said, Riley, you might know the stats better, but something like there's a lot of COVID on her floor, correct? She said 38 out of the 40 residents of her unit have tested positive. Wow, wow. Um, so we pray for, Jane, that she stays safe. We pray for everyone in all the assisted living facilities here in Saratoga and across the nation. Um, scary stuff. Want to keep everybody safe. Um, We've received some prayer requests. Pat Orson messaged in uh, prayers for his son in law, Mike, who slipped on the ice and snow in his driveway, went to the ER, and is getting some tests done to determine the extent of his injury. And uh, Christy Keegan is requesting prayers for her friend, Gary, who's been hospitalized for a third time with a yet to be diagnosed debilitating condition. That is terrifying. So we will, of course, remember yeah. Gary and his friends and family. Absolutely. Pam asked for prayers for her friend, Phil, 27 days in the hospital, COVID-19, um, home now. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, Elizabeth and Harry have some good news. Their youngest, AJ, is engaged. Um, he and his girlfriend, Tabitha, got engaged on New Year's Day. That's wonderful. Excellent. Prayers prayers for Georgia voters for Congress, hopes for a peaceful electoral college count. This is about the election in Georgia on Tuesday, right? Oh, excellent news, Kristen, that your friend Rachel um, seems to have turned a corner. That is really excellent news. Um, we will continue to pray for her recovery. And Christine Jaronski, I see your prayer request for Barbara Florshack, who continues treatment for her cancer of the lung. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Sue. Um, Sue asked for prayers for her children whose father died last Sunday. That's from Sue Ransom. Continued prayers for Kathy Hargis's friend, Ruthie, who begins her next round of chemo this week. Um, prayers for Robin Robinson, awaiting results about autoimmune condition. Prayers of joy for Doug Mills' 75th birthday tomorrow. Happy birthday, Doug Mills. Any other? Prayers, friends, joys, or concerns. All right. I think we are ready to pray. Even if you are typing, um, uh, Sue Sink, I see uh, yours. Um, Steve's brother and sister in law who are dealing with health issues. Absolutely.
So we come, we come together, our first prayer of the new year, and there is so much, so much to pray for as, as usual. And so whatever you are holding in your heart, whatever you are, uh, is on your mind, know that you are, you are heard, not only heard, but you are listened to. And so we pray as an act of our faith in, in confirming that we are not just speaking to the air, but we are being listened to by our, our divine parent. So let us in our separate places, join our hearts together this morning in prayer. Source of life and ground of our being, we come to you this morning with hearts full of gratitude. Gratitude for a page turned, a new year, for a reason to hope, for reasons to celebrate, for birthdays and engagements, for anniversaries and milestones of all kinds, for recovery, forward momentum, for answers, for acceptance letters. Lord, we are so grateful for new life, for new pregnancy, for new puppies and kittens and friendships and ways of communicating. We are grateful for all the reasons you give us to hope, things to look forward to, we are grateful. And Lord, too, in our gratitude, we also hold our grief. We hold in our hearts those who are awaiting diagnoses. Send your spirit to sit with them in that waiting. We pray for those who are sick and in the hospital, who are of a body that feels broken, lungs that feel full for their families and friends who worry about them, who post up bedside or wish they could. Lord, for, for those who are in the hospital or in a sick bed of any kind, we pray your presence and comfort and healing upon them. Lord, for closed communities, for Care, care facilities, for retirement communities. We pray that you keep them safe, you keep their staff safe, that, uh, the co that COVID would, would cease. Lord, for those who are journeying with cancer, we pray for your accompaniment in that journey. For those who are grieving, sudden loss, old loss, Lord, we pray for your comfort in that time of grief. In all the things that we worry for, and all the things that we hope for, and all the things that we pray and hold each other in prayer for, Lord, we turn them over to you. We are a community that rejoices and weeps and works and supports and holds. Thank you for being our divine parent, for drawing us into this new family, your family. May we love and treat and hear each other as such. Lord, you have called us to see one another and to take care of each other, friends and neighbors, until there are no strangers among us anymore. May it be so. And let us pray together this morning in the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Riley. 
Um, we have wonderful news about our pledge campaign, which is that we are doing quite well. The generosity in our congregation has been wonderful. Um, I'm not sure what our number is as of today, but, um, but rest assured that everyone is stepping up in a, in a beautiful way in a time when, um, when things are difficult and a little bit uncertain. So, uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you. And if you have not, uh, Julie just reminded me, uh, we're at 360,000 pledged, which is absolutely phenomenal. Thank you all so much. Um, so if you have not gotten your pledge card into Julie, we encourage you to do that. But um, we also wanna thank you so much for all that you have done and are doing for us and for the whole community. Now is our time when we share our gratitudes with one another. And I was thinking about mine this morning. It's pretty darn basic. It's electricity. Um, so when we had those three feet of snow, uh, whatever, however many weeks ago that was, we woke up to absolutely no power. And we didn't have power for um, most of the day. And we were fine, obviously. Um, but in a gloomy, cold, dark winter, it's really great to have electricity. So that's my, um, that's my gratitude for today. Pastor Riley, what's yours? I actually thought about it uh, already this morning. I am really grateful for international food like Ooh. systems because in the last 24 hours I have eaten both an avocado and a pomegranate and like and had a cup of coffee this morning yeah like it's pretty incredible and of course is riddled with flaws and waste and injustices yeah so like that's one of those things like being grateful but also wanting something better sure um but you know for all the black and brown people who have touched my food from its growing to its transportation and sorting and cleaning and stocking and whatever. I'm, I'm grateful. I'm grateful yeah. for that labor and yeah. I'm grateful for pomegranates and avocados. And part of the interconnectedness of all of us too, right? Yeah, absolutely. Local community. Yeah. Um, Gail is glad to be coming home from California and back to safety and connected. I think she and John Michael are out visiting their son in um, Sacramento, I think. Uh, Scott is thanks for life to live another year. Amen. Um, Nan writes, every time we eat, we are grateful that we have food on the table when so many do not. Carol, grateful for snow up north to cross country, ski and be outside. Um, Pam is grateful that Whisper, who is her, um, her fawn who lives outside is six months old today and is a boy shown by his buck buds on his sweet little head. He and his mom thunder grace her path with their loving presence still. That's great. And Pam is grateful that her daughter Sarah is here to weather this hard winter ahead with her. Oh, that's wonderful. That's fantastic. Um, Kim is grateful to wake up on a happy new year with health and hope. Pam Lipkin, grateful for challenges that help us to grow. Um, Julia is thankful for music, grateful for nature's therapeutic gift. Absolutely. Uh, Harry and Elizabeth are grateful for snow, all capital letters. I'm grateful for snow removal. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, I live in a parsonage that is of the, the Stillwater United Church and uh, the parsonage comes with snow removal which um, ah, is so lovely. That is lovely. Uh, birds at my bird feeder. Yes, Marion, absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, friends, let's pray. Holy and loving God for this and so much more, we give you thanks. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Amen. Amen. All right, um, so this morning we need to do our ordination and installation of our new officers. This is something we do every first Sunday in January. Um, we have never before done it on Zoom, but we are going to do it now. And I think Riley has figured out a way to have us see these wonderful people who are going to be our elders, our deacons, and our trustees. So do they have to do anything, Riley? There's Corinne. 
she might be uh, working on it right now. So I am promoting to panelists all of the folks who are being installed and ordained today. Um, so you should be able to turn on your video and audio. You are going to be rejoining the webinar as a panelist. Oh, wonderful. Here we go. So hold tight as we as we go through this brave new world here. We can all imagine that if we were in the sanctuary, everyone's standing up, walking forward to come and stand in front of everyone. All right, Craig Horth, are you here? And Andrea Ryberg. And I think uh, Dixie as well. Is Dixie here this morning? Yep, she's here. Um, Ann Diggory, do you, do you need to be a part of this? No, because she's already a trustee. You're already a trustee. Um, let's see, Lisa, Aubrey, Craig. Andrea and Dixie. Well, Dixie's here. She just hasn't turned on her video or her audio. Oh, okay. Dan Hughes is here. Oh, okay. Um, there's Dixie. Very good. Well, I am going to um, move forward. Okay. I have um, one screen I need to share with folks. So I will do that while more people hopefully are going to um, turn on their. Uh... Okay. Friends, the vows ordaining elders and deacons are taken in a spirit of celebration. Language and interpretation are both unique gifts of God. God's spirit has worked through us and in us to bring each as individuals to this place with a common purpose. We seek to honor and to advance the traditions and practices of both the Presbyterian Church and the United Church of Christ. We recognize that the function of acknowledging common beliefs is performed by the statements of faith for the Congregationalists in the United Church of Christ and the confessions for the Presbyterians. We make no distinctions among members who belong equally to our federated congregation. According to their individual qualifications and interpretations, we invite members of both the Presbyterian Church and the New England Congregational Church to serve our congregation as elders, deacons, and trustees. Riley, would you mind reading the part of the people for us? You there, are, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit gives them. There are different ways of serving, but the same God is served. There are different abilities to perform service, but the same God gives ability to each of us for our particular service. The spirit's presence is shown in some way to each person for the good of all. Christ is like a single body, which has many parts. It is still one body, even though it is made up of different parts. If one part of the body suffers, all the other parts suffer with it. If one part is praised, all the other parts share its happiness. All of us are Christ's body and each one is part of it. The following people come to be ordained as elders. Andrea Ryberg, Dixie Baldry, Janet Freoff, Sean Devlin, and Craig Forth. Aubrey French, Diane Hughes, Kim Potts, and Lisa Heckman have previously been ordained as deacons and may come forward to be installed. These people have been called by God in accordance with the faith and order of this church to serve among us. They have accepted their call and are before us in witness to their willingness to serve. 
friends in Christ, it is an honor to be entrusted with responsibility for particular service in the ministry of the church, whether gathered or scattered. Having prayerfully considered the duties and responsibilities of your ministry, friends who are being ordained, are you prepared to serve with the help of God in Christ's name and for the glory of God? If so, please say, I am. I am. I am. I am. Do you promise to exercise your ministry diligently and faithfully, showing forth the love of God? If so, please say, I do. I do. I do. I do. I do. Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? If so, please say, I will. I will. I will. I will. I will. You in your own life seek to follow Jesus, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world. If so, please say, I will. I will. I will. I will. You pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love. If so, please say, I will. I, I will. will. Now I'm going to share my screen one more time. Riley, will you do this part? We gather in celebration of the joy that is ours to be partners with you in the service of God. We promise, the congregation promises, your family promises to love you, honor your leadership, and assist you that together we may be a faithful church. And I ask everyone who is out there and we're gonna do a virtual laying on of hands. So um, please raise your hands towards your computer screen. We know that the spirit of God cannot be contained. Um, and we are, all, um, we are all connected even though we are virtually doing this. So let us-, let us let I, see, us. I see our participants are raising their hands in Zoom. Um, that's adorable. Yeah. You are welcome to do that. <laughs> Let us pray. Eternal God, you have called these people to serve you in this household of faith and in the world, which you have entrusted to our care and keeping. Send your Holy Spirit on them that they may serve among us with honor and with faithfulness. Help them to be diligent in their duties that your church may prosper in the mission you place before it. May their example prove worthy for all of us to follow as we are united in Christ's ministry to the glory of your name. God of grace, who called us to a common ministry as the hands and feet of Christ, trusting us with the message of peace, hope, and love. Give us courage to follow where your servants lead us, that together we may show your love to the world through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. You are now ruling elders and deacons in active service in the Church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the spirit of Christ, giving thanks to God. Amen and welcome to this ministry. And before we go, we're also going to do our installation of our trustees who are here. Jim Cumming, Jim McNeil, Corinne Catalano, and Steve Lefevre are elected to serve as trustees of the church, we wish to recognize the responsibility they have accepted. <laughs> Friends, God has given you special gifts to serve and we have chosen you for a special work. Under the law of the state, you will hold and manage properties and as authorized conduct business for the church. By your energy, honesty, and fairness, you will demonstrate Christian faith to those you deal with on our behalf. Do you promise to give the business affairs of this congregation your devoted attention to encourage generosity and in all your dealings work to further our service of Christ in the world? If so, please say, I do. I do. I do. I do. And friends, do you, the members of the church, receive these persons as your trustees? And do you promise to support them in their work for the church? Uh, with the help of God, we do. Let us pray. Holy God, you made this world and called it good and appointed us to manage things as agents of your love. Guide your servants as they represent us and direct our business. 
Help them to be wise children of light who show your trust by being trustworthy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, thank you so much for taking on this responsibility. We need you and we are so grateful for your service to the church. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. As Pam wrote in our chat um, box, God bless you all for the work that you, um, some of you are continuing to do and some of you are um, doing anew for the first time. So thank you. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through and um, stop, your, stop your video. Um, I think what that's gonna do is, is put you back where you're supposed to be. Um, again, this is the first time we've done this. So uh, if, you, if you drop out of the call entirely, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and we are going to join in singing our closing hymn. sustainer. Bless us with hope and peace and love and courage on this day and every day. Amen. Everyone stay safe and we'll see you next week. Take care. <laughs>